Chapter 5 of Skink No Surrender by Carl Hyacin. Right away, I called Detective Trujillo to share my notes. Mally's mention of a drawbridge was important, he said, although Florida has lots of drawbridges leading to lots of islands. Did she sound okay? At first. Then what? She seemed frightened? I almost answered yes, because I was afraid that the police might ease off the search if they thought Mally was in serious danger, if they decided she was just another mixed-up runaway. But the truth was that my cousin hadn't sounded frightened on the phone. Annoyed about something, for sure. At the end of the call, maybe a little edgy. She told whoever she's with to stop something. After that, she hung up. Or maybe they hung up. No, goodbye, Richard, Trujillo asked. Gotta go, is all she said. Like she was ticked off. But not scared. I can't say. It was impossible. It was possible that the fake Talbot Chalk had pinched or even hit Mally for saying too much to me. It was also possible that he'd just swiped some of her french fries or changed the radio station in the car, and that's why she told him to stop and not ever do that again. Mally ruled over the radio, and she didn't like anyone messing with her music. You'll hear from her again, the detective predicted. Meanwhile, I'll call her parents and tell them she contacted you, too. When I got home, Mom was waiting beside the car in our driveway. She said she'd only been gone a couple of days. I told her to tell the surfer boys in Gainesville I said hey. Please let Trent know if you take the boat out, she said. He turns off his phone on the golf course. He won't be playing golf, Richard. He'll be working. He's got a couple of showings. No kidding? That's awesome. I was trying to sound enthusiastic because Trent hadn't sold a house in 11 months. My mother had been paying all the bills, though she never made a big deal about it. Here, she handed me 40 bucks, just in case. No, Mom, I've got money. Now you've got more. I'll call you tonight. After she drove off, I went to the marina and put $20 worth of gas in the boat and headed out to Cutter Island. I caught a good redfish on a bucket, on a bucktail, but I didn't keep it. A school of jacks swarmed in from the inlet, ripping at the finger mullet, and I hooked five or six in a row. They're tough fighters, pure sport. I chased the school around until it got too dark. After docking the boat, I called Trent, who was watching a show he'd recorded on TiVo, a mixed martial arts match featuring his favorite fighter, Lucifer Rex. The man's real name was Maurice Depew, a factoid I dug up on Wikipedia and immediately laid on Trent just to see his reaction. He'd refuse to believe it, of course. I'll be home in half an hour, I said. Mind getting your own dinner? I just ate and I'm kind of into this match which he was watching for, like, the fourth time. A dedicated blob. No problem, I said. Tomorrow night we'll go grab some burgers. For sure. I wasn't waiting for tomorrow. On the way home from the marina, I hit the McDonald's and ordered a quarter pounder, which Mom calls a cholesterol bomb. I went easy on the fries, but still she wouldn't have approved. My conversation with Mally spooled over and over, especially the word she'd spoken to the person beside her. Hey, stop it! Don't ever do that again. It wasn't unreasonable to assume that the person Mally had been speaking to was her traveling companion, the bogus Talbo. Whatever he'd done at that moment while she was on the phone, she hadn't wanted to share the details with me. So deal with it, Richard, I told myself. Just be glad she called. Not wanting to go home and veg out with Trent, I hung around Mickey D's for another hour. Talk about pathetic. Who spends 60 brainless minutes in a fast food joint? I knew Trent was so engrossed in the cage fight replay that he wouldn't notice I was late. He probably wouldn't notice if the kitchen caught fire. I kept the cell phone face up on the table in case my cousin called again. Mom texted to say that she'd gotten to Gainesville okay and was taking my brothers to dinner at some new tie joint. I was in the middle of texting back, telling her about my fishing trip, when three loggerhead police cars went flying past. They were heading toward the North Beach. A minute later came an ambulance with its siren full blast. Yet it wasn't until I saw the searchlight from the sheriff's helicopter that I pocketed my phone and ran to see what was happening. It seems like destiny, how some people turn out the way they do. Certain kids at school, you just know they're going to become surgeons or engineers or internet zillionaires. Other kids are more likely to end up selling cars or hospital supplies or real estate, hopefully with more success than my stepfather. But a couple of my classmates, they're definitely heading full speed for Loserville. There's a harsh fact in every school in every town. Not everyone wants to work hard, and not everyone has a wonderful life ahead. 
Certain kids are going to flame out in the grown-up world, either crash and burn or flop the old-fashioned lazy way. Sad, but true. A guy who graduated with my brother Kyle is doing 18 months in state prison for breaking into a computer store and stealing a laser printer and a box full of Homer Simpson zip drives. Mom knows his parents and says they're solid people. So what happened? A perfectly sensible question. My own past isn't exactly spotless, but nothing my mother ever said or did can be blamed for St. Augustine. That was all me. Another dude who used to surf with my brother Robbie got busted for selling pain pills to an undercover policeman. The guy's father is a minister and his mom teaches violin. Maybe they messed up when they were raising that kid, or maybe he was just determined to go down the wrong road no matter what. It happens. I have no idea whether Dodge only had a rough childhood or came from a good, caring family and just turned out to be a thieving moron. But seriously, what person with a brain larger than a marble would steal turtle eggs for a living? Truly a primitive life, life form, this guy. When I got to the beach, paramedics were strapping him onto a stretcher. His limp right wrist was attached to the rail by a plastic handcuff, basically a zip tie. His other arm was in a soft cast. He was unconscious and heavily bandaged. I knew it had to be only when I saw the pillowcase full of small leathery orbs, which were being counted gingerly by a stone-faced officer from the Wildlife Commission. 97, he said to no one in particular when he was done. I stepped closer and asked what was going to happen to the eggs. The officer, officer said they would be reburied in a safe place on another beach. So they're going to hatch okay, I said. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. We'll see. A crowd had gathered, mostly locals. Mixed in were a few crispy sunburned tourists. A policeman was interviewing a woman jogger who'd witnessed what had happened, so I sidled closer to eavesdrop. She gestured toward the motionless Olney and said she'd seen him digging up a turtle nest. Suddenly, she said, a big bearded man had burst howling out of the sand, and the egg thief began slashing at him with the stake he yanked from the nest site. Describe the person who came out of the ground, the officer said. Tall and freaky looking. The woman spread her arms. This wide. Anything else? He had things hanging off his face like bones or something. Did he say anything? No, but he was singing. While the poacher attacked him? You can't always get what you want, the jogger said. Those were the words he was singing. He grabbed the stake from the egg robber and threw it up in the dunes. Then he struck the poacher with his fist. Yes, sir, the woman said. Hard. How many times? I didn't count. He was wearing, like, soldier clothes. Did you see which way he ran? Oh, he didn't run. He walked. The jogger pointed south. That away. The, sen the scenario was easy to imagine. Dodge Olney had been looting eggs from a real loggerhead nest before creeping down the beach and digging up the decoy nest constructed by former Governor Clinton Tyree, now known as Skink. A greedy, very painful mistake by Mr. Olney. The ambulance hauled him away at high speed. If mom had been home, my phone would have been ringing like crazy. Every time she hears a siren, she calls to make sure I'm all right. This started right after dad's accident. Overhead, the sheriff's helicopter continued to circle, its spotlight slicing back and forth across the waterfront. A young policeman carrying a camera walked over to the fake turtle nest and began snapping photographs. I headed south, searching for boot prints in the sand, using the flashlight app on my cell. The beach was nearly empty because everyone had rushed to the scene of the fight, if you could call it a fight. Trent would have called it a beatdown. Dodge Olney couldn't have been more than 35 years old, yet he'd gotten his butt whipped by an old fart twice his age. It didn't bother me at all, to be truthful. Anybody who swipes turtle eggs to make money deserves whatever misery comes his way. I had a feeling Mr. Olney would be avoiding our beach for the rest of his days, even if he gave up poaching and turned his life around. Skink must have stayed close to the water's edge for the first few hundred yards because his tracks had washed away completely. Finally, I found a fresh set of prints in dry, softer stand, sand, definitely boots, definitely jumbo-sized, and I followed them up through the dunes, erasing them behind me with a palm frond so that no one else could see which way he went. The boot prints ended at a boardwalk leading to a small gated neighborhood of large oceanfront homes. There were no lights on inside the houses because rich people who owned them live up north and came to Florida only in the winter. It was like a fancy little ghost town, and the empty streets sort of sketched me out. Governor, I called out. It's me, Richard. Nothing. 
No sounds except for the breeze rustling the sea grapes. Yo! I shouted. Still no reply. I heard the whine of the sheriff's helicopter and crouched in a thick hedge while it swooped over, lighting up the streets like a football stadium. As soon as the chopper was gone, I scrambled out of my hiding place and jogged back towards the beach. How the man caught up with me, I have no clue. I never heard him coming, didn't even know he was behind me until an ape-sized hand seized the back of my t-shirt and yanked me to a stop. I nearly peed my pants. Stay cool, boy, he whispered. Okay, okay. My heart was pounding like a woofer. I need a small favor. Sure, I rasped. Anything. There was only a slice of moon, but it was bright enough for me to see that Skink wasn't wearing his shower cap. His long, damp hair was matted. He stood bare-chested in his boots and board shorts. His army jacket and camo trousers must have been stuffed inside the duffel bag. I need you to be my dear, devoted grandson for a little while, he said, in case someone asks. No problem. A friend's leaving a car for me at the corner of Askew and A1A. I knew right where that was. We'd have to go back the same way we had come, possibly encountering police officers searching for the person who clobbered Dodge Olney. You need to lose those gnarly things in your beard, I suggested. Yeah, he unfastened each of the buzzard beaks carefully as if they were delicate Christmas ornaments. Here's our story, he said. You and I went for an evening stroll on the beach together, okay? We didn't see anything unusual or suspicious. If they ask for my ID, you tell them the family doesn't let me carry one because I'm always losing it. I'm so old and forgetful. Tell them some days I don't even remember to take a shower. But we still love you, Grandpa, I said. He broke out laughing, a thunderous rumble. As we made our way north, he snatched up a length of driftwood and said, My trusty cane! He started fake limp, faking a limp as we drew closer to the yellow lights of the beachfront district. I took his devil, duffel, which was heavy. If we were questioned, I'd say that my crazy grandpa took off his clothes and went for a night swim in the surf, sharks and all. Luckily, nobody stopped us. A single police cruiser remained at the scene of the egg, egg robber's misadventure. The officer at the wheel was writing his report and never glanced up as we passed on the other side of the street. The car left by Skink's friend was a mid-sized gray Chevrolet Malibu that needed a good coat of wax. It was the most ordinary car imaginable, which I suppose was the whole point. We found it parked in the lot of a bikini shop where my brother Kyle had tried repeatedly and unsuccessfully to get summer sales job. Skink sat down on the driver's side of the Chevy and groped along under the floor mat until he found the ignition key. I opened a rear door and heaved his bag onto the seat. You're a good citizen, Richard. Hey, you're hurt, I said. The car's interior lights had illuminated a comma-shaped gash on one side of his head. Although the wound wasn't long, it looked deep. See, Mr. Olney didn't want to have an adult conversation. He wanted to be a tough guy. The governor shrugged. There's a first aid kit in the trunk. Needles, sutures, iodine, plenty of aspirin. Sutures? Skink smiled. Mr. Tile is a thorough fellow. A whale song rose from my pants pocket. It was mom calling from Gainesville. I let the phone go to voicemail. Skink nodded approvingly and start after starting the Malibu. The gas gauge said full and the engine idled smoothly. With his good eye, he studied himself in the rearview mirror, arranging his tangled silver mane to conceal the scalp gouge. Now I could see that it wasn't normal surfer shorts. He wasn't. Bleh. Now I could see that it wasn't normal surfer shorts he was wearing, but funky old boxers. Don't worry, he said to me. I plan to do some personal grooming down the road. Have you got somewhere to hide? Hide? Another earthquake laugh. At my age, son, the trick is to keep moving. Always have a new project on the board. That's what keeps you going. So what's your new project, I ask. You don't have to tell me if you don't want. Of course I'll tell you, the governor asked. I intend to find your cousin. Want to come? <laughs>